With that, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35. Starting next week, we'll be inviting someone else to come up and read Scripture again, as we the last couple weeks we haven't, but uh, we'll start to have other people in our church read God's Word going forward. Here's the Word of the Lord, Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35. And that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went to them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, said to him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found that it is it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So when they drew near to the village to which they were going, he acted as as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did, we, did not our hearts burn within us while we taught to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words that you had Luke write down for us to remind us of what took place that third day after your sacrifice on the cross. How you appeared to many of the disciples and specifically these two men. Lord, thank you for these words and what you're about to teach us through it. And Lord, as we celebrate this day, Resurrection Sunday, Lord, may we again see a glimpse of your glory and remember the great God that you are. 
So Lord God, we ask you to open our ears to hear for you, from you. Open our eyes to see you. And give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Here's a little picture for us. Does anyone know what this is called here? Oh, the name's right at the top there. Pistol star. <laughs> this is actually a star that some scientists have found, but something unique about it. And here's a little, some information that I have written down here that I've learned about this star cluster. George Johnson writes in the New York Times that in October 1997, scientists at the University of California and the Space Telescope Science Institute released this photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a massive, unseeable star. What sense does that make? How could that be unseeable and how could they have gotten a picture of it? Well, here's how. It's been dubbed the Pistol Star it stands near the center of our Milky Way galaxy and burns as bright as 10 million suns and is as large as the entire space inside the Earth's orbit. So from Earth to the core of the sun, that's how big they say this star is. This raises the question, where did the scientists get the photograph? Good question, isn't it? In reality, the picture is a computer-generated image based on measurements of infrared rays, which are not visible to the human eye, but are detectable with scientific instruments. Computers convert these waves into colors, and voila! We see a picture of the biggest star in the galaxy. Imagine a colossal star blazing 10 million times brighter than the sun. But we can't see it without special equipment. Just as huge realities like the star are not perceivable without special equipment, so there are spiritual realities that a person cannot perceive without special equipment. Hmm. What equipment could that be? Any guesses? The Holy Spirit. It's important to note that with our passage this morning. It could be that these two disciples had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Well, we know that because in Acts chapter 2 is when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. So they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And yet it says here in this passage too that, that Jesus closed their eyes so they can recognize that it was him. Not that their eyes were closed physically, but they'd see Jesus but didn't recognize him. What would it have been like to be walking on that path with those two men and Jesus? And then yet, for Jesus to talk about himself to these men, only later to reveal himself and then disappear before them. Well, I think there's a couple lessons for us, three lessons from this this morning. Three things that are important for us to understand. Here's these two men who didn't see Jesus, even though he was right before them. Kind of speaks to our world today, doesn't it? Speaks about those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And how everyone needs their spiritual eyes to be opened up so they can see Jesus, the one true Jesus. Not the Jesus made up by other people and other stories, but the one true Jesus as described in God's word. So there's three things to learn here. First is this. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Again, in our passage, these two men are walking along the path towards Emmaus, going home to their homes. And all of a sudden, Jesus catches up to them and starts talking with them. And they, Jesus knows that they're talking about the events and asked them, what are you guys talking about? Of course he knows what they're talking about, right? I think that God has a great sense of humor. 
Because for Jesus to come up to them and say, what are you guys talking about? What, what events in Jerusalem? What are you talking about? What things? <laughs> I, I wonder if Jesus was just in, in, his, in his own heart and mind kind of giggling a little bit. <laughs> I'm talking about myself here, guys. Are you ready to see me reveal myself to you? Yet these men were still blinded. And it speaks to us too that we need to examine ourselves too. Is there some way that we don't see Jesus? That there's maybe something that God wants to teach us that we're not seeing because we need to examine ourselves so we can see. In verse 21, they say they had trusted. That is, they had trusted. But here for a moment, they had lost their faith. They had become delusioned all because they did not realize the full realization of Jesus' deity. Here's some points for us to understand too as we examine ourselves so that our eyes can be opened to the truth so we recognize and understand that we need Jesus. A. Examine if there's sin in your life. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be flipping a little bit this morning. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. You can keep your finger in the passage we just looked at too because we'll be coming back to it. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, which speaks to this point here, to examine if there is sin in your life. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. As we've seen with these two men again, they were, they were having doubts for a moment there. They had heard the stories, the women had seen Jesus, and that some of the brothers had gone to the tomb and seen it empty, had seen an angel, but not Jesus. And so these two men then were blinded. They, they heard this news, but they were blinded to the truth of what took place. There's another man like that too. His name is Thomas, one of the 11 disciples. We, we call him Doubting Thomas for good reason. Because he said too, one time when he was standing with all the other Christians, saying, you know, I won't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead until I can put my fingers in his nail holes. In the nail holes in his hands and his feet. And what happens? Suddenly Jesus appears before them and then suddenly Thomas believes and Jesus even says to Thomas, Thomas, come and put your fingers through my nail holes. And, and Thomas' response is that he now believes. And Jesus says to him, you believe because you see, but blessed are those who believe who have not seen. This speaks to us to t- examine ourselves, to get examined if there's sin in our lives. Now, we might face hardships and trials at times, but that doesn't necessarily mean because we've sinned. But I always like to say, too, that when, I, when I'm facing trials, I do need to examine that. See, Lord, is there some sin in my life so I can get right with the Lord again? But if not, if it's not because of sin, maybe because it's for another reason. Which leads us to be, examine if you understand the word. Examine if you understand the word. I think that's why we have a lot of errors in the church today where we have these different ideas that are not in line with God's word. That some people say that, well, science says this though and so, so it doesn't line up with God's word and so we'll believe the science over God. Well, do we not recognize that God is the one who created science? <laughs> and the term science only means knowledge. It's what we know. So we need to test science against what God says in his word. Sometimes, yes, we, we might misunderstand God's word and need to read, study God's word, but sometimes we need to make sure that we understand God's word. That's why it's so important for each of us to learn how to study God's word in depthly and properly. So examine to understand the word. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 to 14 says this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand 
the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So again, we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand the Word of God and to study it, to make sure we understand God's Word properly so we believe rightly, so that we can see God clearly. See, examine that you believe about who you are in Christ. This is an important thing because sometimes we get lost in our identity. Our our world tells us that we have one kind of identity or even look at how we greet each other when we meet someone new. What's the question that's often asked? Well, with men, we ask the question, after we find the person's name, we say, what do you do? I mean, what kind of job do you do, right? Men often take their identity in their job. How do women greet themselves, each other, when they first meet someone new? They ask questions about relationships, don't they? Like, are you married? How many kids? Relational more things. It's because men often put their identity in their jobs and women put their identity in their relationships. And then further in our world, there's some people who have their identity in other things that are worldly, things that are not of God. But for us as Christians, we need to understand our identity in Christ. Neil Anderson put together a really good description of who we are in Christ so we can understand our identity. And with this is a list of verses as well. We're not going to look at each one this morning because it would take too much time. So if you want to um, have this, I can send it to you by email with all the verses to listed with it so that way you can look them up on your own um, at a later date. But So here's our identity in Christ. First of all, if you are a Christian, that is you have come to Jesus Christ confessed your sins to him and made him Lord of your life, you are accepted then by Jesus. What does that mean? It means that you are God's child. It means that you are Christ's friend. It means that you have been justified by God. It means then that you are united with the Lord and am one spirit with God. It means you have been bought with a price. That's what we celebrate this Easter season on Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate Christ's death and rising from the dead to offer us his gift of salvation. At the cross is where he paid the price for our sins. Also, because we're accepted by Christ, we are a saint then. It's not some title that another church gives. It's the title that God gives you at the moment of salvation because you were once a sinner. That's the identity we had before we were Christians. A sinner. When we come to Jesus, our new identity is that of a saint. Also, we're accepted and we have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. It also means we've been redeemed and are forgiven of all our sins. Not just the simple sins, but even the ones that we deem as really, really bad sins. It doesn't matter what awful things you've done. Jesus has forgiven you of those things. And lastly, I am complete in Christ. That's not the only part of our identity. Also, our identity in Christ is that we are secure in Him. What this means is that we are free forever from condemnation. When we stand before God someday, we will not be condemned for our sins because God has forgiven our sins. God's Word actually tells us that as from the east is from the west, so far has He, he, he has removed our transgressions from us. Also that He forgets our sins. He buries them. He's washed them away. He remembers them no more. So we're no longer condemned by God. Part of our security, too, is that we are assured that all things work together for our good. Even when things are tough and hard, 
God still allows those things to happen for our good to bring us closer to him. Also, we are free from any condemning charges against us. Makes sense, doesn't it? We know that the evil one, Satan, and, and demons are the accusers. They accuse us before God. But God tells us that, that we are not condemned anymore of these charges. Also, our security in God means that we, are, we will not be separated from the love of God. Also, we've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. That means our salvation is secure. Also, we are hidden in Christ, in God. We have this confidence that good work that God has begun in us will be perfected, especially when he calls us home to heaven. We're now citizens of heaven and have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Oh man, I, I don't know about you, but how many times do I forget about this part of our identity in Christ? That we don't need to have a spirit of fear or anymore, but we have a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Also, we can find grace and mercy in times of need. And we are born of God, and the evil one cannot touch us. There's actually one in this part here that I think Neil answered missed. You know which one it is? It comes from Romans 8, verse 37, that tells us that we are more than conquerors. That God can use us to do amazing things. We are, because of in Christ, we are conquering over sin and death. We don't have to worry about the, the things of this world, the trials, but we conquer those things because of the power of God in us. Also, I am significant. I am the salt of the earth a branch of the true vine, a channel of his life. We have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. It's important for us to remember as Christians. We're not called just to have our fill every Sunday and come to church and, oh yeah, now I feel good because I've had the time to praise God and hear from his word. But it's more than that. It's doing the work God has called to do together too. He's appointed us to bear good fruit, not just to sit there to allow God to use us. We are a personal witness of Christ too. We are God's temple. We are a minister of reconciliation for God. We are God's co-workers. That is, God uses us to do his work. And we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Physically, we're on this earth now, but our spirit also is with Christ. We are God's workmanship and we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And this last one, I love this one too, which comes from Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you have rejected yourself and who you are in Christ, I encourage you this day then, and even in this moment, to take time to confess to the Lord that you've rejected yourself or your position with the Lord. And as you've seen these things, your identity in Christ, remember that is who you are in Christ. Remember the creator of this universe who spoke this whole world into being saw fit to create you. Therefore, you are a beautiful creation and you are significant in God's eyes. So that's the first thing. As we kind of learn from these men on the road to Emmaus, they needed to examine themselves and where they were at because they had a lack of faith in that time. But the second thing for us to examine and learn is to listen to God's teaching. Back in our passage this morning, verse 25, we see these words. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones. How would you like to be called that one with those two men, right? <laughs> but yet they were foolish because they had lack of faith for that moment there. O oh, foolish ones, and slow of hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Here Jesus is discipling, teaching these two men on the road to Emmaus. And he's teaching them, telling them, hey, don't, don't you recognize and understand what the scriptures say? The prophecies about the Christ? What was to take place? See, the Israelites had this wrong idea of the Messiah. They had this idea that, that the Messiah was going to come and rescue Israel from the yoke of the, the Romans. He thought he was going to free them from that. But Jesus is going to free them from much more than the Romans. He wanted to free all of humanity from their sins. So that's why Jesus tells them, hey, you need to listen to the truth of what is being taught in the scriptures by the prophets and understand truly not having your own idea but to understand truly of what is said of the Christ. It speaks to three things. A, the word is truth. God's word, the Bible, is truth. Psalm 119 Verse 160 says this. The sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. God's word is truth. To know what Jesus taught, what God wants us to understand and to know is all in his word. What is need to live life rightly for the Lord and to how to be saved. Now, is it important to understand things like mathematics and how to read and write? Yes, those are important things. But the most important thing is to know God's word because God's word is truth. Yes? Verse 160. Yeah, Psalm 119 119 is a long chapter. Psalm 119, verse 160. That's what we just looked at. And B, the Word teaches truth. The Word teaches truth. 2 Timothy 3.16. For some of us, this passage is very familiar because it's kind of one of those go-to ones when people are saying, well, is God, why should I follow and believe God's word? It's, after all, it's just a book written by a bunch of desert dwellers and sheep herders and goat herders. Well, <laughs> you've probably heard that argument, right? Regardless of who the author of each book of the Bible is, is irrelevant because it is God's word. Second Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So God's word teaches. That's why we're to study God's word. And see, follow the teachings of the word. John 3, verse 36 I'm not going to read the second passage there for now, but just three, John 3.36. I do invite you to write down the other passage. By the way, if, you'll, if, if we're going through this too fast, uh, just let me know and I can give you a copy of the outline for this down the road as well so you have all these passages. Um, as, as many of you have heard me say before, uh, we don't want anyone to be bamboozled, right? It's okay to test and see, am I speaking the truth of God's word? Um, And if you don't understand, we can work through it together. Again, John 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. That second part there, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Now, it's not saying that works save you rather that first of all we're saved by grace 
by God's grace alone. But if we don't obey Jesus, it speaks for how we probably maybe not be a Christian then. Now, does that mean that oh, we have to live sinlessly perfectly between now and Christ returns to take us home to heaven? I don't think it's saying that. Uh, because Jesus knows that we will still sometimes stumble and sin sometimes still. But are we willing to humble ourselves yet then again and say, Jesus, I've sinned in this way again. Forgive me. And be repentant of that. So it doesn't mean that we live a perfect life. God calls us to live perfectly, but he knows that we're not perfect. At least in this lifetime, we're not. So that's why in John, 1 John 1, 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're to follow the teachings of the word. The third point we learned this morning is to open yourself up to God. Back in our main passage this morning, in verse 31, we see the reaction of these two men after hearing Jesus teach them and actually after breaking the bread with them, he disappears and here's their reaction. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Because these two men, their eyes were opened in this moment, they then opened their self to God. And the following words that they said, they were so excited that they said, seen Jesus risen from the dead, that they ran right back to Jerusalem, which was seven miles away. Was it seven miles? Yeah, seven miles. Um, seven miles is pretty close from here to Ross Haven, pretty close to there. From here to, to Ross Haven is about 14 kilometers, 14, 15 kilometers. So it's pretty close to, to seven miles. Imagine walking that distance from Ross Haven to here or from here to there. But that's what these two men did because they were so excited that they had seen Jesus. They had experienced what some of the other disciples had already experienced too and seen the risen Lord. They couldn't wait. It was even getting dark, but they still ran back to Jerusalem. Man, I wish there was more Christians who were like these two men. That because they've heard the gospel and see the gospel, we're, are so excited to go, hey, let's share the gospel with others too. Tell people about Jesus, what he's done. Because it's amazing what he's done. He's risen from the dead. Yeah, he rose, he died on Friday, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. What speaks about an amazing Savior? God would raise his son from the dead for us so that we can be saved of our sins. Well, may we as all Christians, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone. I'm even speaking to myself on this because I, yes, I'm passionate about sharing the gospel, but I admit there's days that I, I need to be more excited about this and sharing the gospel with those who are lost. Because it's an amazing story of what Jesus has done for us. So these two men, they run back to Jerusalem all excited. Man, I just feel tired thinking about running or even walking seven miles. But yet think of the excitement these men must have had running back to Jerusalem then too and excited and sharing with the other disciples. We've seen Jesus. We've experienced what you have as well now too. Man, let's tell others about Jesus. So open ourselves up to God. There's three points to this too. Ask God to open your eyes to see that God is awesome. I'm just going to invite you to write these passages down because of, of time. Um, but I, it's important for you to look at these passages still because they still speak to these subpoints. Um, but see that God is awesome. We see that throughout studying and reading God's word that God is awesome. This past Thursday night, we joined together with some other churches for a Passover meal. And, and we did that as a, as a means to allow us to see the Old Testament come alive a bit more for us. And Pastor John, or Pastor John, Pastor Josh from Parkland Baptist shared as we went through the Passover feast together, related also to about how Christ is the Passover lamb and how he died for us. 
It was neat to see of how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover feast. In this feast, though, we had, we had a lady who he asked to come from his church to share her testimony. Testimony of how she used to be in the occult and how she, how she got into it. And then also how she realized that she was living in sin. And in a moment, she, the way she describes it too is only that God was in that moment with her. That she sensed God's presence because she felt the weight of her sin, the awfulness of being a part of the occult. And she confessed that to the Lord. And she said that as she confessed that, she felt like a weight was lifted. And so many changes happened in her life, in her family's life. She saw her husband come back to the Lord. She also saw her mom a, couple, a year later come to faith in Jesus Christ. She has seen some of her friends who are part of the occult turn to Christ as well. She had shared too that there's, there's 60 some or more occultists who recently have come to the Lord in, to faith in Jesus Christ and shared how God is doing something amazing even in that dark place. The light of Jesus is being shone upon people. And people are realizing they need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. In him is true power, power over sin and death. There's no power in the evil one or Satan or worshiping him. True power is in Christ. It's an amazing thing to hear. After I heard her share her story, I wanted to sh jump up and shout, that's awesome. <laughs> I love hearing people's testimonies because that's awesome. You might be thinking, well, my testimony is not as big as, as a person coming out of the occult or someone who's been involved in drugs. I've lived a pretty simple life and, and just slowly came to faith in Jesus Christ. But that's awesome still. No matter how small or big a testimony you think it is, in God's eyes, it's a big testimony. That's awesome. Seeing God move and work is awesome. Seeing God in all his creation, how he spoke all of this into existence, and how he continues to create through th seeds and through uh, the joint of a husband and wife. That's awesome. B, ask God to open your eyes to see your need for him as well. Even if we're a Christian, we still need God, we still need Jesus especially if you're not a Christian this morning, though, my prayer for you this morning is that you will see your need for Jesus. Because you can't do any amount of good works on your own to be saved from your sins. God's Word tells us that you cannot be saved by your works so that no one can boast. It's what Jesus has done for you. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That wage, a wage is what you deserve. It's what you earn. As you work a job, you receive a wage. Wage You get paid for the hours you put into the job you do. It's what you deserve for that job. Same thing with our sins. It garners a wage. It's the, the wage of death. And that word death, the Greek word means not just dead, but it means the eternal punishment in hell. But the second half of that verse says this, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gift is what we celebrate this weekend. Jesus' death on the cross on Friday, rising from the dead to offer us his gift of salvation on the third day. So ask God to open your eyes to see your need for him. And then see, ask God to open your eyes to receive him. I'd like to ask this question of those who aren't Christians, and I don't, I don't know where everyone is at this morning, those who are here or listening online. I don't know where you are at spiritually. But I think it's always important to ask this question. If you are not yet a Christian, why? What's causing you to not take that step of faith to Jesus? And to walk forward to him and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe that I'm a sinner and, and only you can save me of my sins. And from this moment now, I choose then by faith to live my life for you. 
Jesus gives you an invitation. And he's giving that invitation to you this morning. See, Jesus loves you so much. God's Word tells us that no greater love than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. See, Jesus calls you friend then because he laid down his life for you. He loves you that much. He loves you this much. There can't possibly anything that is that important to get in the way from you receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. So this morning, after this worship time is done, I invite you to come and talk with me. I'd love to chat with you further about how you can receive God's gift of salvation and the change He can make in your life, freeing you from your sin, freeing you from the consequences of eternity in hell and giving you eternal life, eternity with Him in heaven. If you're listening online and obviously you won't be able to come to talk to me face to face, but in the description below of this live feed is my email address and phone number. And I encourage you to contact me even today because I'd love to share with you more of how you can receive God's gift of salvation. Here's the three things again we learn from this passage that we learn from this story of Jesus meeting up with these two men on the road to Emmaus. We learn that we're to examine ourselves to listen to God's teaching and to open ourselves up to God. Allow God to speak to us. Allow God to draw us to himself. In closing, in just a moment, I'm going to play a video for you. It's to a song called I Can See, a song that was written and performed by David Meese. And, and I think it fits well for what we've been listening to today. These two men on the road to Emmaus were blinded Maybe it's because their grief certainly was a lack of faith. And maybe we're walking like these two men today. Maybe we're walking with our eyes, our spiritual eyes blinded. But may our eyes be opened like these two men later in the story. Ask, Lord God, open my spiritual eyes so I can see you anew. So I can understand you more. So I can grow closer to you. So I can love you more so we can have that deep relationship with you. May we, even in this moment now, be able to say that I can see.
couldn't bear for him to leave me So I begged him to stay Spend the evening a few moments Before he went his way Then like a host he stood and blessed me Broke the bread and poured the wine Then there was something I knew I recognize Yes you see? Can you see who walks with you? It's my prayer today that you do. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the story of these two men walking to Emmaus. And even in the midst of their doubt, you walked with them. You spoke to them. And you revealed yourself to them. Lord, we're so thankful that you revealed yourself to us. That you revealed yourself to us as the Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, our friend. Lord, I pray for each person this morning who does not yet know you. Lord, that their spiritual eyes will be opened now to see the truth of who you are and how much you love them. And Lord, for the rest of us who are believers too, Lord God, may our eyes again be opened anew to seeing how awesome you are and to see how you walk with us too. Lord, even at times, like the Psalms say, even though we walk through the valley of shallow death, We'll fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort us because we know you're walking with us. May we see that you are there. 
These things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.